The next panel is absolutely near and dear to my heart, and uh, this is uh, when I started out my licensed production um, grow back in 2012. Uh, the, the original business plan was to, in fact, have a 95% CBD facility, which you could not raise funds on to save your life back then. So, uh, having been acquired now by Canopy Growth last year, it gives me the utmost pleasure to see these people here on this panel. Um, and that is going to speak to you about the CBD industry and uh, is this in fact a game changer. So the way we're going to do this is actually in two parts. It's going to be, a, a, we're going to have Tim, it's going to do a little bit of a presentation first for 10 minutes and then we're going to go into the panel discussion. So Tim Phillips is uh, the UK Managing Director of CBD International, or Intel, for me. He's Managing Director there um, and they provide professional independent market analysis as well as regulatory tracking for this growing cannabinoidal uh, sector, both here in Europe, sorry, and internationally. He's a lawyer by trade, uh, has worked with the regulators, the FDA, the UK government, and uh, couldn't be really happy to have you here for your work that you've been doing also with the European Commission. So with that, I'm going to get straight to the panel. Uh, have a good day. So it's fantastic to be here, um, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from these parts, um, I'm over from um, the UK, and um, this session is about CBD, but it's also, as I'm going to explain, very much about international opportunities uh, for this industry in general, so I think we could have focused on, on that as well. Um, quick thing about me, I know you, you heard a little bit about uh, that, but we are a, uh, an independent data provider for the CBD industry. We're actually better, and I have to admit, we've not been in the CBD sector for all that long. We're, we're very much um, well known in the, in the vaping space, and we've um, been operating for about five years in, uh, in the e-cigarette sector through a, a persistent publication called e-cigarette intelligence. Um, I only mention that because I'm going to come back to some of the parallels between vaping and uh, CBD and the growth of the CBD market. And there are a lot of things that I see happening in this industry right now which remind me very much of um, vaping about five years ago. A lot of the challenges I think that the industry is facing were faced by the uh, e-cigarette sector a while ago. And so, um, so I think it might be interesting to, to look at that. Um, as I said, I'm going to focus quite a bit on international markets. I hope that's um, still of interest to you guys. I think it is of interest generally for the, for the sector as well. So, one of the things I'm, I'm going to talk about a bit is that I think, uh, and we think, that CBD is the biggest opportunity for international expansion for this sector as a whole, right? Um, now, you probably look at me and go, well, a guy from CBD in Italy would say that, wouldn't he? But I'll, I'll tell you a bit about why I think that's the case. Um, one of the main things, actually, is the regulatory landscape for cannabis across the world. And I think it's one thing to bear in mind when you're looking at cannabis in general and cannabis regulation. If you're looking at it through the prism of Canada or, or North America generally, I think you maybe get a slightly skewed view of the world's kind of policy direction in, in cannabis. Um, there's, a, there's a clear movement, right, towards opening up markets and liberalisation in general. But I think it's really important to understand that um, European markets, Asian markets and so on are not exactly the same as, as they are over here, certainly in Canada and in parts of the US. Um, one of the things I think to think about is that, um, you know, in our minds, I guess, um, regulation for cannabis fits into two sort of main opposites. One is the, is the general move towards medical and pharmaceutical cannabis markets. Um, clearly, that's a movement that is, is happening everywhere, and we're seeing it happen in, in uh, Europe as well. Um, even in the UK, which is traditionally very conservative on these matters, has moved, as you probably know, this year. Um, as a result of a big media thing around, around kids and getting access to cannabis products. Um, so you've got that happening on the one side, and it's happening, but it's happening fairly slowly. Um, on the other side, of course, you've got the adult recreational market, and, um, and I think it's important to, to realise that those, you know, those are some way off in Europe, certainly. Um, and what we're interested in, and what we're talking about today, is really what sits in between, which is the CBD market. So it's a, very much a consumer product, it's considered as a consumer product. Um, it doesn't require uh, a government 
plans for move towards adult recreational use legislation, and therefore, you know, in our view, it really is the uh, it is the big opportunity. It's consumer driven. Again, this slightly reminds me of vaping, right? It's a grassroots movement where people are going out there to buy these products. Um, uh, it's word of mouth. It's not like companies in the space can go out there and, and talk about the benefits of CBD. Um, it really is a, a, a grassroots movement. It's very like um, vaping was five, ten years ago, where you know smokers were out there wanting to get a product that uh, could get them off combustible cigarettes and and fat vaping, and, and it wasn't like anyone was being told about that. The focus internationally for CBD is very much on, on Western countries, um, so affluent uh, markets, definitely health and wellness focused markets. Um, I came back from a trip to Japan a couple of weeks ago. You know, Japan has all the elements of a successful CBD market there. Um, so they've got an aging population, they've got high uh, disposable income, they're very interested in health and wellness. And, you know, for me, that, th those kind of ingredients are what you need for a, for a successful market. Um, We'll talk about some of this, but the, the market in general, internationally, is very fragmented. Um, so you've got very different sets of products. Um, you've got uh, all sorts of different distribution channels. And, um, and one of the major things I think we'll talk about in the panel is just the quality of the products out there. You know, this is an unregulated, effectively an unregulated market, and that has a big impact on quality of products, labeling, and stuff like that. Um, we've got regulation in continual development. So that's kind of, I guess, what we try to do is to find out what is happening to make sense of this very complex regulatory environment. Um, but it is constantly in change and, um, and, and you know the policy around both CBD but the cannabis general, as you well know, is, is constantly changing. And then just last point, so big business is getting uh, clearly involved in this and, and one of the opportunities I think that they see globally, particularly as global brands, is, is on CBD. I'm not going to spend too long on this, but just to, to touch on the regulation of, um, of CBD in Europe, particularly because I think that's a sort of clear um, first area of interest. So it's all around hemp, and I know that you guys know well about that, and we've, and we've got Farm Bill hopefully being signed um, in, in uh, the US very soon. You know, the same in Europe, right? It's, it's all around hemp, and it's CBD derived from hemp. Um, but there are lots and lots of restrictions around hemp and the, and the kind of crossover between hemp legislation that allows you to, to grow and, and manufacture products using hemp and, and then kind of narcotics legislation. Um, there's a lot of crossovers there which can conflict. Um, I don't think I'm going to go into any of this, we can come back to this later, but I mean there are various restrictions on, um, on the plant. One of the things that you, you guys might be um, really interested to know is this very low level of THC content that's required to allow your hemp um, product to grow. So, you know, 0.2% THC is extremely low, and I'm no expert at this, but clearly what a lot of people tell me is that, you know, that really complicates the process of being able to manufacture and, and extract CBD. Um, one final point to make, the regulations around CBD in general are very much focused on the product, you know, the end product that you're selling. So it's, it, it depends very much whether it's a, an edible or oil product where, it, where it's considered to be a food and therefore food legislation exists. Um, we can talk a little bit about, you know, full and broad spectrum products and, and whether or not they impact on um, what we have in, in, uh, in Europe on the novel food regulations, right? So food that wasn't in existence prior to 1997 is considered a novel food needs to be uh, prior, prior, at least prior approval before it can enter the market. And um, so there are various issues around that which uh, are worth bearing in mind. Right, I'm just going to throw up some slides now. This is some work that we've done in um, yeah, particularly Europe and, and looking at sort of form factors whoops, in, um, uh, in some of the markets. So here are three regions that we've looked at in terms of the CBD products on the market. So this is a fairly small insight into um, a number of online retailers in both the UK, the US and, and the EU. Um, the main point I want to make here is just that um, you know, clearly uh, oils and edibles uh, form the main section of the market in all, three, in all three regions. And interestingly, I don't think there's huge differences in the types of products that are being offered in the CBD sector between these different regions. So that, that would be enough to say on that. Pricing. Um, Average pricing, uh, and, and what we're looking at here is the, the milligrams. I'm sorry, it's quite weird. Um, the, the, the milligrams in, the, in, in each of the products, you can just see comparing the, the UK to the US and the EU, there's some similarities to price. So, generally, on average price per milligram, we've got quite a lot of similarities. Um, 
But, and I think this is a very big but, when we look at that particular market like the UK, that did that, I, I didn't do anything there, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I just moved by the side. Right. Um, this is work we did in, in, on detailed um, product analysis in the UK. Um, so the bars, the green bars, uh, and, the, and you can see the, the, um, the y-axis on the left is the number of products in the category. So you can see kind of just, you know, obviously oils are, are dominant in terms of uh, products in the market. Um, but I think what's, what's most interesting about this is not that the average prices are roughly the same, those are the, the orange and, um, uh, and yellow triangles down there in the middle. What's really surprising for us is just the huge range in price you get for each of these products. So this is a price per milligram, um, and I think what it says to us is just how variable the market is and how much price differential there is between the most expensive and the, and the cheapest product. And the big problem in the market in the UK and actually, frankly, uh, in most uh, big CBD markets is that the consumer has no idea what they're paying for. They really can't differentiate between these products. And it's very difficult to establish brand in the market at the moment. Um, and particularly without a kind of a regulated environment, it makes, it makes things very difficult. So, so for, for us, I think this is one of the things I know that Megan wants to, to touch on, but you know, this idea that CBD is a kind of snake oil, it's a wild west, there are tons of products out there that are not, um, not high quality or not containing the, 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 the CBD um, content that it says in the bottle. I think this really um, talks to that point. Um, again, this, I'm not going to bother with this, but this is just again showing that the price variation is really quite extreme in, in two different types of product, products, oils and, and liquids. Um, okay, just a, a far, final few slides on, um, but we did some consumer survey work, so a thousand um, CBD consumers in the UK, and we've done it in, in a few other European markets as well. Um, I just thought it might be interesting to pull out some of the main findings of this. So for the UK, clearly the dominant reason for using CBD is, is to relieve pain, that's very clear. Um, when we look at um, kind of the male-female ratio and the, and the age range uh, ratio, it's quite interesting just to see that, um, that there's, a, there's an over-indexing, if you like, for, for men using CBD to relax. There's an over-indexing of, of women to use it for, for reducing anxiety. Um, and then um, again, with age, there's a, there's a sort of an over-index of, of reducing anxiety for, for under 35. So stress-related use is, is, is for younger people, and relieving pain is, is clear for older. The spend, um, well, we're, we're definitely looking at the spend. This is in pounds sterling, so multiply by, you know, one and a half, something like that, for, for Canadian dollars. Um, you know, the range is between the 10 and 30 pound mark um, per month on spend. Um, there is an over-index of, of men spending more and of under 35 spending more, which I think is potentially quite interesting. Um, product use, well, we've already talked a little bit about this. Oils are clearly predominant. Um, but we've got quite a lot of e-liquids going through the market as well. Um, and uh, again, in terms of the male-female ratio and the, and the age rate, we're seeing more, more men um, using flour and more men using um, crystals and liquids. So, so there tends to be more vaping being done for, uh, for CBD with, with men. I think this is the final one. Um, just where are these products sold? What's interesting about this is just that although this pattern is quite interesting for the UK, it's completely different in every other European market. So the distribution channels for CBD at the moment are, are really varied. Um, so in the UK, we've got a big predominance of online, but we've also got a lot of health food stores selling um, product. So um, anyway, that's, I hope, some interesting stuff to talk about, and I think um, over to the panel.
Hi guys, I am Igor Kowalczyk, I am professor at the University of Lesbridge. I'm here representing Kanta Earth, I'm corporate director in the company. I'm also co-owner and uh, a director at Implanta Biotechnology, a great company, and past Air X Medicinal Company. Excellent, thanks, Ed. And I didn't introduce myself, so let me introduce myself. I'm Megan Henderson, I'm the executive producer of ThroughUp.com. Um, and so, you know, when we were talking about preparing for this panel, there's a lot happening in CBD. It's a very hot topic right now around cannabis, and I think there's as much um, credible information as there is misinformation out there in the market. So hopefully we can help dispel some of those things. I think it, most importantly, and one of the things that we hear a lot is, you know, how uh, CBD is going to be, you know, the, it, it is already becoming the new health and wellness uh, trend, and, you know, Igor, you know, I would ask you, especially given your medical background, you know, is, is CBD going to be the new vitamin C or the new omega-3? You know, we, we've gone through stages, especially in the commercial market, where it's, you know, every day you've got to have your omega-3s, you've got to have your vitamin C if you want to be healthy and balanced. And is, is that where we think CBD is going? Right. Well, that's a great question. I, I would say that it will be much more than uh, any of the two uh, that you mentioned, uh, not only by the effect of human health, but by the uh, ability to make money uh, out of it and by you spending on it, right? So uh, if you compare the, uh, the vitamin C market, it's probably approaching a billion dollars or so uh, a year. Uh, the omega-3, probably around two billion dollars a year. But both of those uh, already slow down tremendously in their growth, four to five percent a year. Uh, compared to CBD, we are just in the beginning, we already reached a market of five to six hundred million and we're growing at 30, 40 percent uh, a year. And this is only because there are a very limited number of countries that uh, uh, do that. But uh, with more countries coming to, uh, to play, uh, we see the growth to 50 to 100 percent a year. It means in three years it will be the number one uh, uh, product that you would want to use to your human health. Compared to the health, well, vitamin C is an antioxidant. Yeah, it's good for, for maintaining in general your uh, good uh, uh, health. Uh, Omega-3, uh, well, it, it improves your probably membrane health. Again, generally good. Uh, they have a long time uh, 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 until the effect is there. So you, you cannot, uh, for your pain and inflammation, you cannot take vitamin C and omega-3 and, and be relieved in an hour or two. Uh, CBD, in, in contrast, can remove inflammation within an hour. So our experiments demonstrate that by application of uh, CBD oil, uh, especially uh, in a whole plant extract, uh, two cells and tissues release uh, inflammation uh, in an hour and in two, three hours it returns to back to normal when inflammation is induced by UV radiation or lipopolysaccharides and messengenic bacteria. So, so CBD is an actual true uh, health product that can remove inflammation very quickly, uh, something that you uh, would want to take regularly. And uh, I don't think that vitamin C or omega-3 or any other supplements are remotely close to this problem. <laughs> Tim, you know, you brought this up in, in your uh, presentation a little bit, and I think, you know, it, it dovetails on what Eva was saying. You know, we we see all of these products, even in a regulated market like Canada, before October 17th, there was lots of, I could walk into a health food store and find pet supplements with CBD in them, um, hemp CBD, I, uh, some lingual sprays, and things like that at, at, at shows like this, you know, long before legalization came into play. Uh, and, and in a lot of places, we see a lot of claims about the diseases that CBD can help, and there's research coming to bear on, on some of those pieces, but do you feel like from a market perspective and a consumer opinion that there are some claims that are unsubstantiated that may make CBD seem like a snake oil or a panacea for a, a cure-all for everything without necessarily the backup for that, and does that damage um, how CBD grows and the quality of, of or the perception of it in the market? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Megan, I think it's great. The, the, um, the, the, the CBD market that I'm seeing develop is a, uh, again, it comes back to vaping. It really reminds me of the vaping market um, early on. It's, um, the, there are tons of people, in fact, a lot of the vaping companies that were making nicotine containing in liquids have suddenly shifted into CBD because they see an opportunity there. And um, uh, 
because it's not well regulated, because there are no real kind of standards being set for the industry and so on, um, there are plenty of people who are producing product that you know, may not be being produced particularly well, may not be, um, may, may not contain the, the milligrams of CBD that, that the bottle says it has. Um, there's huge examples of, of mislabeling going on. And, um, and I think, the, and, and, I, and to your point as well, I think there's a, there's a sort of an over-exuberance in, in, in people's description of this product solving all sorts of problems that potentially it doesn't, right? Um, and it doesn't do the industry any good at all. The, the, um, the, you know, the only way to solve that, though, I guess, is to have some sets of, of standards imposed. And I think it really is, from my experience of vaping, right, the, the, the thing that the industry needs to do is set up its own standards, because what you don't want to happen is that you know the FDA uh, and, and various other government bodies around the world set the standards for you because that's when things go really wrong, right? The irony of the Canadian market is that it's now incredibly difficult to get a lot of CBD. You can't really buy it in very many places. It's clearly, you know, it's a regulated product. It's it been pushed into the, the regulated environment here in Canada, and that means that consumers can't get hold of it easily. Um, when we talk about the product, I mean, you work. With extraction and things like that, uh, you know, and Igor mentioned it as well. When we talk about what makes a good product when it comes to CBD, you know, should we be talking about isolates or should we be talking about the whole plant? Yeah, that's a that's a, a, a definitely a tough question for um, the, the chief science officer at a um, CBD company that does isolates. Um, <laughs> so. And, and, you I can't know, make it easy on you, Alan. Okay, I gotta be careful. <laughs> Sorry. Definitely one of the uh, one of the I think the biggest challenges that we have right now is that we don't really understand the the full benefits of what CBD can offer uh, the mammalian uh, species uh, or, or class. It's it's I think in large part because most of the studies that, that have been done have been done on CBD isolate. And, and so I, I just maybe want to backtrack a little bit, just to understand, you know, I don't know the, the audience well enough to, to be able to, to understand where, where everyone's at in terms of understanding um, CBD in general. Um, so a CBD isolate is essentially going to be an incredibly pure form of, of, of a molecule. So oftentimes the isolates are about 99.9% um, of that molecule. Uh, whereas a, a whole full spectrum oil um, is essentially going to be a crude extract in which you will have uh, many other cannabinoids, uh, including CBD. Uh, you'll have, which, and often if it's uh, derived from a uh, cannabis plant or a high type 1, type 2 uh, cannabis plant, it's going to have THC in it as well. Um, it's going to have flavonoids, uh, it'll have terpenes, and that's, that's what we would consider a, a full spectrum oil. So the, the company that, uh, that I'm the CSO for, we actually use uh, industrial hemp to isolate um, our CBD. So I want, I want people to understand that regardless of your source of, uh, your, your, source of your, your CBD, if you're doing an isolate, it's gonna be 99% pure. Uh, whether it's coming from cannabis um, or whether it's coming from industrial hemp. There's other issues with industrial hemp. Um, I, I still think industrial hemp is a, is a great gateway of getting uh, cannabis uh, legalized. And, and so I saw a real, during prohibition, uh, there's a real value for industrial hemp. Uh, but now I'm starting to see that, that uh, in in certain states and, and in our country, uh, prohibition is over and, and we need to start moving on from uh, industrial hemp. Not to say that we should be moving on from hemp. Uh, I still believe strongly in hemp. And once again, just to, to remind everyone, it's the same species. Uh, it's an arbitrary definition of what is hemp and what is cannabis. And, and I say arbitrary because, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was a couple of Ag Canada scientists uh, in Ottawa who, who made a recommendation, uh, in a, in, I think it was just in a white paper, where they described what, um, or maybe it was, a, it was a published article, yeah. And they just described that 0.3% THC is a, is a good uh, level uh, to distinguish what is going to be hemp and what is going to be cannabis. And in fact, if you, if you go back to the paper and you read a little bit more about it, it was talking about uh, sampling uh, leaves 
from uh, from the lower parts of the plant. It, it, it was uh, prior to uh, fluorescence uh, that you were harvesting and determining the, the 0.3% THC. So, so we, we, we sort of already bastardized what is um, defined as, as, as hemp anyway. I'm, I'm a strong advocate that we should redefine what is hemp and allow for about 1% THC or slightly, slightly more. So, yeah. so it, it, we have to remember that it is arbitrary and, and so we, we should, as Health Canada, uh, feel like we can, we can change that. Um, so actually trying to answer the question. Um, I, I, you know, I draw, I draw a lot upon uh, a recent study that uh, um, came out of Hebrew University, uh, Galili et al., and in which they were, they were doing a, 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 a comparison between a CPD isolate and a full spectrum cannabis oil. Uh, and what they found is that, that they created a, a bell-shaped curve uh, response to the CPD isolate. So uh, initially, there was no response to, they were looking at pain. Uh, initially, they were looking at pain, and they also looked at um, its impact on uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, which is, uh, uh, has some, some bearing on certain diseases like cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, clinical depression, um, IBS. So they were looking at, at its impact in that, and with the CBD isolate, what they found is that there was a, a kind of a bell-shaped curve. So at, at a low dose of CBD isolate, it had no impact. Uh, it's slightly higher, it started having an impact, and that at very high doses of CBD isolate, it had no barrier. It, it, it uh, did not address the pain, nor did it uh, affect the impact of uh, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. In contrast, they, they, they then used a, um, uh, a full-spectrum oil I think they were using um, uh, canatonic. Uh, canatonic is, is similar to what we would call ACDC um, and uh, high, high cannabinoid uh, cannabis plant has a fair amount of, of uh, CBD. It's got a, a, a 1-2% THC. It's got CBG, CBC, which is, which is a, a rather hard uh, Cannabinoid to get it's a recessive cannabinoid, so but it had some CBC, it had some CBG, and I believe CBDV, uh, along with uh, a full terpene uh, spectrum. So uh, what they found there is that there was a strong dose uh, uh, dependent response. So very very simply, as the more you add, um, the better the the, the uh, addressing of, of, of pain or um, the TNFA. So uh, in, 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 in that sense, you can see that the CBD isolate was not working as well and it's very difficult if you are, are trying to regulate uh, dosage. So you don't know how, how to regulate the dosage because if you put it on too, too high, it's not going to have any impact. If it's going to be too low, it's not going to have any impact. And that's definitely going to be diff very difficult as we get into cosmetics, as we get into uh, um, beverages, um, to see if it's actually having, you know, that, that's where you start getting into that snake oil issue. Um, but what was also interesting in that same study, and this kind of um, uh, has been mirrored by others, is, is the idea that you actually use a lot less CBD to get the same bang for your buck if you include other cannabinoids and terpenes. So oftentimes the, the recommended um, rate is, is like 50 grams per kilogram. So, for example, if, if, if when you're looking at Epidiolex, um, which is, uh, uh, I believe, that 20 to 1, or 20 to 0, um, it's, pure it's pure CBD. Um, and, um, and, and then the, the uh, uh, if you add, if it was, originally it was proposed to be a 20 to 1, and if you actually use the, the 20 to 1, you would use probably closer to 5 grams uh, per kilogram. So it's, it's an incredibly large amount of product that you have to use if you're using an isolate versus uh, a full spectrum oil. Igor, I see you shaking your head a lot as Sam is going through things. So if, do you agree with that? Do you feel like full spectrum is really the way for, for users to do the most bang for their time? Well, uh, absolutely so. Are. I, I started from um, doing the uh, massive review literature on the effect of pure cannabinoids and extracts, and um, 
For example, on cancer, there are over a thousand papers that demonstrate the effect of pure cannabinoids. Very effective, and only two that show the full uh, spectrum, full flower extract. And both of these papers show that the effect of uh, cannabis in the full flower spectrum was uh, three to five fold higher in killing cancer cells uh, than uh, just cannabinoids themselves. Uh, the experiments in our lab uh, demonstrate we, we've done studies on uh, breast cancer, glioblastoma, uh, colon, lung cancer. Uh, we've done anti-inflammatory properties for, uh, against UV and pathogenic bacteria. We've done uh, aging skin diseases and in our experiments <coughs> the effect sometimes 20 times higher. So if you, uh, uh, as I said, if you would need 20 times uh, less CBD uh, in order to have the same reduction of inflammation, say by 50%. So, uh, by all means, uh, full spectrum is the best thing that uh, uh, you can have. Sorry, most of your companies. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be the former CSO. <laughs> So as soon as we demonstrate that certain cultivars are good for a certain type of disease and condition, and we demonstrate what effect cannabinoids uh, have and what effect the whole uh, extract has, whether it's uh, terpenoids, whether the waxes, uh, uh, whether those are vitamins, their uh, amino acids, whatever there is, right? We don't really have to know un until we know, unless uh, until we know that it works. Right then, uh, what we can do, we can separate those cannabinoids, very simple, uh, from the rest of the molecules and use this as a base, active base. And in this case, any company that's done this research can patent this as proprietary technology. And you simply use ask company to add a certain amount of cannabinoids, CBD, or for example, that requires to activate it, right? So this becomes non-regulatory molecules anymore because it doesn't have cannabinoids, right? So easy to sell easy to administer, and if you want to have effects like a, a, a Lego puzzle, you just add two, add drop one, drop two, and you have effective compound. So uh, it's, it, I think it's a novel approach to regulation of entire cannabinoids uh, in stress medicine. And, and I think that sort of, again, goes into the next topic really well, and, and I'm going to start with Adam on this one, but I think both of you probably have, and I'm going to come back to Tim, don't worry, I'm crying, you're there, you're there, but uh, you know, when we talk about these different things, you know, there's different methods of extraction for CBD, and, and I wonder, you know, are there, is one better than the other, or are there, there are more optimal extraction methods that people should be looking for when they're looking at CBD products? Well, I, I, don't, I definitely don't want to steal uh, Ivan's thunder. He's got a great panel at, uh, at 4 o'clock, um, where they're, I think they're doing a, sh uh, a bit of a, a showdown between CO2 and, and ethanol, uh, so I, I encourage that. I mean, our, definitely our bias, um, if, if we're looking to get a full spectrum oil and making sure that we're getting uh, the, the, the best and the, the greatest amount of, of other cannabinoids beyond the THC, uh, we would definitely be promoting a, an ethanol extraction for that. CO2 is, is great at pulling that um, uh, THC, uh, does a great job, you'll probably get about 80, 90 percent, maybe more. Uh, but you don't, you get maybe 30 to 50 percent of the other cannabinoids. Whereas uh, ethanol will, will probably pull about 60, 60 percent of, of the other cannabinoids. Yeah, I want to add basically to answer your question, I, I, I would correct the uh, question itself. Because okay. uh, our, if you're asking our extraction of cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoids rather than CBD, because it doesn't matter what extraction you use, because in the end, if you were end up with isolates, it's just an efficiency, right? It has nothing to do with medical, because CBD doesn't change its molecule, regardless of what type you use. But if you talk about the medicine itself, then again, whatever uh, extraction that pulls all molecules uh, uh, into your extract, that, will, that one will be the most efficient for the health perspective rather than a business perspective. Awesome. Okay. Can I ask a question? Just to, to, because, um, again, sorry to bring back into the sort of international aspect of this, but one of the major kind of discussions that's going on in the in certain European market is um, around this um, issue of novel food. Um, and the argument goes like this. If you, 
that there was hemp oil in the market pre-97, right? If you produce a full spectrum oil, then that has the same chemical composition in theory as the hemp oil that was in existence pre-97, right? You're shaking your head, but that's the argument, right? Um, and therefore, it's more likely to be acceptable to, to regulatory authorities in Europe. So, um, I mean, my question is, okay, well, what, do you think that's right or not? Clearly, I agree with you shaking your head. But, um, but also, we've got this new concept of broad spectrum um, CBD, which is you know very low THC, so the THC has been removed, but everything else has been left in. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, first, if you clarify, because I, I, I in 77, I was only nine years old, so so was it really yeah, hemp oil? Or it's 97, 97, 97, 97, okay. So was it seed oil or it is? I think you, I think you told me it was seed oil. Yeah. So then, of course, of course, seed oil does not have cannabinoids, right? So uh, it's basically cooking oil. Well, yes, it has great potential because it's very balanced uh, oil, so, uh, but it has nothing to do with say, any medical properties per se, right? So when we talk uh, hemp oil uh, and cannabis oil, uh, we should not mix it up because uh, one refers to oil pressed from seeds, another is referred to oil that you basically use as a carrier to whatever you extract it as a full spectrum of cannabinoids. So uh, we're, we're at our, like, our last 10 minutes, and there's a couple of questions I still want to cover. So, so Tim, um, you know, when we look at the international market, and we, now that Canada is legal, and we're obviously heavily really regulated right now, but you know, where do we see the future of CBD going in, in the marketplace? You know, are there trends that we're already seeing in, in the UK and Europe that we think are going to happen here? We know, obviously, there's a lot going on in the US states that have the, you know, CBD infusions and edibles and things like that. So, so what, what should we be looking for to happen in this market? I think, um, uh, I mean, if I had a crystal ball, then, you know, I, I wouldn't be sitting here, but, but, um, but I think, you know, the, um, the, the market, in, in my view, is much broader than the, the, the you know, the, the, the kind of cannabis market, the marijuana market, if you like, um, here in Canada and the US. Um, you know, what, what, one thing that was really interesting from the survey we did was just the, the huge, broad spectrum of people that, that were users of, uh, of CBD. And, um, you know, all age ranges, all, um, all, all, you know, all sort of socioeconomic backgrounds and so on. And I think that's one of the defining features of the CBD market, perhaps more so than, than the marijuana market. Um, what's the future? I mean, what's clear is that, um, you know, oils are, are really dominant. I think this whole issue around broad spectrum, full spectrum is, uh, is kind of ongoing, and I do see that continuing to grow. Um, but I, but I also see, you know, the, the, the possibility of, of regulation and, and, um, and certainly some kind of standardisation in, in the sector going forward. So I think those are the things that are gonna, we're going to be looking at next year. And, and last question, I'm going to put this out to all three of you. We'll start with Adam and then move, move down. But, you know, as consumers, we want to make sure that we're, we are getting the best bang for our buck and that we're buying um, something that's going to bring value for money and it isn't a snake oil or, or a placebo or whatever the case may be and, and I know Tim you, you feel there is still value to that placebo effect so you can maybe talk about that and get to but I guess what I'd like each of you to do is, is tell us what as consumers we need to look at when we're going to purchase CBD infused products um, you know what are the watch outs and how can we ensure that we're really getting a quality product uh, great I, I'm just going to preface that a little bit, I, very tangentially too, that, that I think one of the things I'm most looking forward to um, is, is now that we're putting um, breeding back into the hands of the in, in, in hands of breeders like in, in Planta, uh, but also back into the subculture, and, and we're going to start getting, uh, we're going to start producing hemp that is going to have a full cannabinoid profile and a full terpene profile. And, and uh, using using conventional bread breeding techniques, <coughs> su suppressing the THC to the point where where it's still going to be considered hemp or or our new definition of hemp. And so that's what I'm really excited about seeing. Um, in terms of really answering your question, I, I think um, the, the the things that worry me the most are um, things like synthetic uh, CBDs, uh, simulated CBDs. Uh, they're already out on the market. They don't perform as well. Uh, we never do anything synthetic as well as nature does it. Um, so that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, and, and what I really want uh, as a consumer to look for is, is uh, and this goes back to um, the, the 
company that I work for, uh, they make sure that all their products are USDA organic, um, but also um, uh, that we start looking for the, um, the good manufacturing practices seal on, on products to, to make sure that, that uh, your CBD is being uh, processed in the, in the proper way. I personally think that with that, as a consumer, we have to demand uh, how your product was made because one way is to uh, receive your uh, CBD oil in the form of actual full extract from the plant without any major modifications. Totally different thing is when the, you can extract, for example, uh, a plant with, without uh, confirmed properties and just add CBD to bring concentration to a certain amount and sell the product. So now you mix in two different things uh, entirely. So we, the, the CBD oil for best efficacy and medically has to produce from plants that show this efficacy that was stably bred and everything and consumer has to demand how this oil was produced, how the molecules were mixed together. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not a scientist, so I'm, uh, I suppose I, uh, you know, I defer to you guys, but I mean, uh, I guess one of the things that was defining for the vapor sector in terms of defining products that were quality was, uh, was all around the, uh, the testing of the products um, and, and brands that would, you know, really overtly um, talk about the testing of the process that they went through, the way that they went through the manufacturing process. Um, those were the ones that, um, that tended to do well. But as I said before, I think, you know, the difficulty at the moment is that consumers are having to make up their own mind. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, I, I guess there's a lot of, you know, word of mouth, these brands are good, this is brand is not a good brand. Um, one of the things to look for, I guess, is, is price as well. If it's, if it's worryingly cheap, I think you should worry about what, what's in the product. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we have about five minutes left. If anybody has any questions, feel free to come up to the mic. Hi, Val. Thank you very much. Uh, great, great panel so far. Question about CBD delivery system. So we're growing organic hemp here in the Fraser Valley, and uh, working with a team that's, that's talking a lot about nano emulsification, or wrapping uh, the CBD molecule in fat lipids to improve efficacy of uptake by avoiding liver um, metabolism. Are you guys seeing a lot of demand for different methods of ensuring the efficacy of uptake uh, for consumers? So basically, it, it, it will all depend on regulations. There are now certain uh, provisions, let's say, from Health Canada, how the product can be delivered, right? So, uh, uh, personally, I believe that uh, uh, something like transdermal patches, if it's a systemic, would be good, right? So if it's a surface uh, patches that uh, work on skin, uh, ideally the product that uh, uh, goes through your mouth directly to your brain, pretty much, would be ideal. So. Uh, Waving is a great thing, maybe some, some little sprays. Uh, if you want to do uh, uh, in, intestine, so gel caps would be good. So, but you have to also know that it accumulates very slow and stays in the organism much, much longer in the fatty yes, in the, the fatty tissue. So, it will all depend what whether you need immediate re re relief, right, or long term effect of the chronic conditions, and it will depend what health can allow us to do. As well as your uh, organic certifying body, you want to make sure that uh, uh, you've got a, a good organic product and you just don't want to lose that certification because of your uh, technology that you're using to deliver it. I have a bit of a smoke oh, ready for me. Okay. Um, a two part question kind of the government um, regulation, and hopefully we catch it before they grab it, uh, taking control of. Uh, or big pharma um, treat in terms of treating depression, anxiety, and PTSD. What kind of research is there on that, and could they potentially take that from like they did in uh, the film? I can't just, yeah. So basically, there is research on everything that you mentioned, mostly on the level of cannabinoids, uh, right? So, but not as a whole uh, plant medicine. Uh, regardless of uh, what needs to be done, uh, health can will regulate it as a dean, so as a uh, drug, so it means you need all the phases of clinical trials. It's very long and very expensive. Oil will regulate as natural products uh, that is much simpler and cheaper, but even there you have to demonstrate safety uh, uh, that help uh, against depression and PTSD. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'm a dermatologist in practice, uh, and what I want to do is some clinical research. And what I find is when I go to the derm literature and say, <clears throat> what strength of CBD do you use to treat patients? I can't get a number. Is there a source of reference that I could use that would say, 
Well, this is the kind of strength we, could te we should test CBD with. I have no idea. We have process of patent will be probably out within a couple of weeks, so our, um, talk to me, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some. Thank you.